Welcome back, everybody, to the Oakland A's franchise on MLB The Show 23. Today, we're going to go through our second MLB draft of the series. I felt like our first draft was very successful. It gave us players such as Aaron Don, our first round pick, who dominated down at AA before just getting called up to AAA last episode. He's probably not far away from making his Major League debut, even though he was drafted just a little while ago. We have more players who will work their way up the organization, such as Luis Estrella, Cam Cope, and Elliot Hughes. For my draft episodes, I like to, of course, do the actual draft, but then let's talk about the prospects here in the organization, who is close to making their debut, and where are the minor league teams at. It's a really good time for us to just regroup and get an idea of where the future of this team is headed. We have two prospects now in the top 17. Tyler Soderstrom is rising up the rankings. He's, of course, getting close. We will draft, and then I plan on getting into some player lock games and talking more about these players. And we'll round out the video by simulating forward a bit to try and get these draft picks under contract. This is a really big episode for us. These drafts, when you're in the stage that we are, it just makes me feel like I don't want to make a huge mistake because these are so important to actually getting this team a proper future. So we've made it to the 2024 first year player draft and I feel like we've done a pretty good job scouting the players that we like for number three. Joe Michael, a lot of you in the comments say he could be a generational pitcher. Now he's looking for huge money. I expect he will go number one, but if he is there at three, it's very difficult to pass, even though he's looking for a massive bonus. And if we draft him, it does alter our plans the rest of the way because he'll eat into our bonus budget we have. But if he does go number one overall, I also really like Tommy Yi. He's 19 years old and looks to have a very high ceiling as well. 83 to 98 potential and looking for a very different signing bonus. I also saw a lot of love in the comments for Wan Yong Cho, but I have not finished the scouting report on him. I wish I had discovered him a little bit earlier. So with that 55% scouting in mind, I would think about it maybe with our second pick or so. But I felt like the right way to go with this draft is to focus on that top pitching prospect that we're hoping to add. And then I feel like if my top two options go, I really like Andres Nunez. And he's 21, so he's a little bit more of a sure thing. The ceiling might not be quite as high, but we're still talking about a top three player on the MLB board. Number seven on ours. We have three pitchers that I think have extremely high ceilings. I'd be happy with any of them. We can talk more about guys like Miguel Cabrera, Luis Ibar, Estevan Silva, but it doesn't matter if they go between 3 and 38. So I think we should go get into this draft and see how it all unfolds early on. Does Joe Michael indeed go number one or do we have a chance at maybe the best player in this draft? I have filled up our queue with many of the prospects that I had fully scouted or nearly fully scouted that we've talked about over the course here of season two. Hopefully we come away with a class as good as in year one. All right, let's get underway. The Washington Nationals are on the clock and with the number one pick, the Nationals select. Oh, we have a, a player I wasn't expecting here. Mariano Castillo, a closer, number one. Didn't they just sign Josh Hader in free agency? All right. Oh, yeah, supercharged Jordan Diaz hit three homers against the Yankees in a 10-5 loss. Number two. Wow. Joe Michael's going to be there for us if we want him at three. Andres Nunez just went... Wow, I have four minutes to make my decision and Joe Michael is there. So a $10 million bonus. That's huge. And right away, you know, that would take a lot of other players out of the running with later picks. Juan Young Cho, $3 million. We have like 13.3 or $9 million. So you have to think about how this all fits together now. 
Mauricio Santana, 4.3. Like, that's just not going to work. You have to start going after players then who have lower salary demands. Maybe you can get a Percy McGregor, although the scouting on him has shown maybe he's not as good as I originally thought. But down the board, there are some players I like who have lower salary demands. And you never know who's going to be there at 38 in the first place. But we have a chance right here to go with Joe Michael. He is 18 years old. It might take him a little while to get up to the show, but it looks like he's going to start out with a pretty decent overall and sky-high potential. Number one on the MLB board, number one on ours. The only thing you don't like is that he's looking for a bonus that puts signing the rest of your class into question. Very good strikeout upside. High hit per nine. He's supposed to be an ace caliber pitcher, and maybe he does struggle a bit with his control. Maybe the home runs are an issue, but, you know, some of the best in the game will give up home runs when they're not on their game, but when they are, they're nearly unhittable. Looking at Tommy Yi instead... A more balanced skill set with still a high strikeout upside. And Nunez was my third favorite pitcher, and he's off the board. So it really is a two-player deal, and it depends on if you feel like you need the money to sign picks later in the draft. Say you are really wanting to go get a Mauricio Santana. That's what you have to do with your first-round pick to make it work. All right, that's enough. We're taking Joe Michael, number three. If we have a chance to take the best player in the draft, given our team situation, we will. And we'll figure out the bonus situation later. Joe Michael, welcome to the Oakland Athletics. But now I really wonder who's going to be there when we pick again at 38. There are some players I really like there. I'm hoping to get some relief help this season. And I really am going to be targeting Diego Dominguez. And he's projected more so after that second pick. I'd take him a little bit earlier to make sure we get him. But I'm really high on him. And the bonus demand fits nicely with what uh, Michael is looking for. Wan Yong Cho just went number eight. I didn't finish his profile, but I feel like if you did, there's a chance that he'd be, I think, even closer to a top ten player on our board. The power looks elite I think that Detroit got a really good player. Mauricio Santana is now off the board. He goes to the Arizona Diamondbacks. I liked Santana, but I knew he was a little bit limited with all of his eggs in the power basket. David Matsumoto and Damian Dutzman are off the board, two players I liked a lot. I didn't have the info, though, on Matsumoto. I wish I had, again, been able to scout him more. Minnesota ends up going with Tommy Yi as their first round pick. What's interesting about the scouting in this game is just the way it's done. You are going to have significantly more players unscouted than fully scouted. So the board you have is going to be wildly different compared to any other team, which makes deciding when to take a guy more, uh, you know, nerve wracking than other games in their draft systems, I think. As we approach our pick at 38, I think we're happy with how the board is falling. Very few targets are disappearing from our draft queue. Miguel Cabrera is still at the very top. Alfonso Montez behind him if we want to double up on pitcher, and we should be in a really good spot to double up if we want to. We ended up getting two really high potential pitchers last year as well. Michael Rode just went. I liked him, but not this early. And the final pick before we're on the clock once again. The Nationals went with a closer. This time around, Lester Newby wasn't a target of ours. We are on the clock. We have four minutes. And top of my queue is going to be Miguel Cabrera. 18 years old. He is a very good contact hitter. And will have 77 to 92 potential. So another 18-year-old would be a little bit risky. But that's the way the MLB draft is. He's looking for a $1.4 million bonus. So the way I have players ranked here is just how they were ranked on the team board. But I look at some of these skill sets and then the fact that Alfonso Montez wasn't even ranked on the big board. And I'd probably wait a bit longer on him. Especially because I don't think he has a, a major strength for us early on. And we already took a pitcher in Joe Michael. 
So Diego Dominguez is there, and this would be a bit of a reach, but we'd for sure get my favorite relief option here in the class. McGregor was kind of a bust, and then it's Miguel Cabrera. We pick here at 38, and then again at 74, so it's a long wait before we're on the clock again. We are going to go with Miguel Cabrera here in the second round. I just really want to get that switch hitting contact bat that has good speed. Cabrera is our pick here in the second round. And that's a 1.5 bonus. So I've got to keep... Uh, I'm going to be adding this up while I go here. We're at 11.5 and I forget if our budget is like 13.3 or 13.9. It's 13.35. I've checked uh, an old uh, clip. So that's the number I'm keeping in mind. The next player I'd like to take would be Diego Dominguez. We have a significant lack of relief talent here in the organization. And like I said last episode, I don't need the best relievers. Find me like 21, 22 year old prospects who are more developed, more of a sure thing, and just give me someone solid. And I think Dominguez has a pretty good ceiling on top of just being uh, older and coming in maybe a little bit higher overall. All right, Mark Smart is off the board. He was towards the top of our list. Pretty solid starting pitching prospect. And now Domingo Gomez is off the board as the starters that were in our top 10 are disappearing quick. Percy McGregor is off the board. He just went to the Miami Marlins. I would have been more interested if his hitting ratings stayed around where they were, but... Now everything looks to be below average at 90% scouted. I have a feeling if he finished off his profile, he would have plummeted down the rankings. Wow, Atlanta just took him at 63. No way. Diego Dominguez off the board. That one really hurts. I liked him a lot. And I considered taking him with our second round pick. It was just, I felt Cabrera offered too much upside and a perfect fit for a role that really hasn't been filled yet on the team. So I do have a backup plan at reliever. I do like Paul Siebel. I just don't think he was as good of a prospect. And then there's Alexis Ybarra, another reliever. So I came with more options. And we are on the clock once again. So Alfonso Montes is still there if we want to add another starting pitcher. Could quickly turn that into a really intriguing part of our minor league system. And then you have Patrick Haynes there as well. 70 to 85 potential on him. Both him and Montes are not ranked on the MLB board. I think here, this is a competitive balance pick. We're going to pick again in just a couple selections. It's a really good chance for us to double up on pitcher. And I think if we just want to follow the potential 76 to 91, that's a, a friendlier range here. And still we're in good shape bonus wise. So Montez, good uh, walk per nine. So that's not a huge concern right off the bat. Haynes does give you more of the strikeouts. I mean, you could end up just taking both here and say, we'll figure out reliever later. This is just too good of a chance to, to really get the pitching better on this team so we're gonna take Alfonso Montez our bonus money now if everything goes by demand is at 12.1 giving us 1.2 million dollars of room you can go with Haynes right here and just say we're gonna build up this pitching the best we can Henry Vasquez is also here with a 69 to 84 overall potential with uh, strikeout upside that definitely catches my attention I don't like where Haynes' stamina is at, and then you look at where Vasquez begins with his strikeouts and where he could end up. I think I'm going to go with Henry Vasquez here, and we're really getting this pitching strong. I might not end up getting a reliever in this draft. We're taking the better players available, I believe, and if we can't find relief help this year, it'll just have to wait. We're going to simulate to our next pick, and the board has completely disappeared all but one player is gone i was thinking about james brantley here although his potential isn't there just to get a power bat but that's okay but now i'm a little bit less prepared for what to do here with our remaining picks because Derek hanks 
Like we had scouted him, but the potential looks good. It's just nothing else looks good here at all. I think the rest of the way we might just be taking a chance on a few different players. And Cecil James is a reliever we could possibly look at. Then we have Byron Garland. And he's an infielder who doesn't project as a great hitter. We're going to take Cecil James. We'll finally draft a reliever. 432,000 on the bonus. That's uh that brings us to 13.25 million dollars. So, we could sign these players to those values, but that would be it. Now, I don't know if because we have so much interest here in Joe Michael if maybe we can get him to sign for lower. Actually, now it says his bonus demand is down to 8. So, I can redo all the math. I noticed it seemed like things were changing when I was selecting players. So let's see how it all calculates now. This is actually a lot better because now we're at 11.25 and that gives us a whole $2 million to work with. And now that should fit the whole class. The skill sets we're taking are getting a little redundant here, but Luis Crespo is 19 on the board. I never finished scouting him but I just don't see a lot of uh, better opportunities here. So we'll take him and then I have a player in mind for our last pick if he's still there. He wasn't there, so we're just gonna go with Jesse Rivera, a switch hitting outfielder to wrap up our draft for this year. So there were a couple things I would have liked to do that we didn't get around to in this draft, but I think that's still pretty successful. Like, you can only really be prepared to, uh, you know, hopefully get the first two rounds to your liking and the rest is just making the most of what information you still have. And I feel really good about the picks that we made, starting with Joe Michael, the number one prospect. Oh, really? Our all-star for this year was Jace Peterson. I assumed it would be Seth Brown or maybe Cody Bellinger. How did it become Jace Peterson? He has a .8 war. Anyway, every three days we're going to have a chance to work on signing our draft picks. And the top priority is going to be getting number one pick for us, Joe Michael, under contract. And that was easy. He signed an $8 million contract, just like we thought. Miguel Cabrera then signs a contract worth around $1.6 million. Then we sign Alfonso Montez to what he wanted. We're on to Henry Vazquez now, and we're 4 for 4. So the rest of the players here, we didn't actually have fully scouted, and I'll take this chance to actually try to get a little more information before offering the contracts. Crespo signs. First decline, it's from Cecil James. And Jesse Rivera signs. Good news, Gunnar Hoagland is healthy now, and that means he can be added back to the active roster, but someone has to go down in that case. And it's going to be JT Ginn who has struggled this year. And we signed Cecil James, meaning our entire class is under contract, and I was concerned about Joe Michael's demand that ended up not mattering because it dropped by 2 million. This left us with 1.3 left over. At the end of this episode, I'll take us to August 1st where we're going to see the ratings and potentials for these players. But between now and then, it's time for us to talk about the top prospects already playing for us. That's also not to mention that the trade deadline is around this uh, time of year, and last year I did bundle the draft and trade deadline together. And now I'm going to find those teams that I consider to be buyers at the deadline, and those are the only teams I'll trade with. So I'm not going to take another terrible team's prospects. But I think the other four teams in our division are all in play. Throw in the Yankees and the Blue Jays. I guess these teams at the top of the AL Central... The Braves, Mets, Cubs, Dodgers, Padres, Brewers, and Cardinals. Aledmus Diaz has been really the only player that I've thought about trading at this point, just to, you know, get something for a player whose contract is expiring. Toronto has offered us Miguel Giraldo, a 23-year-old infielder who has good contact skills, solid plate vision, Work in progress defensively. 
He has one game of Major League experience this year, and he's hit 268 at AAA. Not really going to be a power threat, but an on-base guy and uh, somebody who might develop into a contributor. He wouldn't play short for Toronto. Diaz would probably slide into third base. I'm going to make a counteroffer, actually, and this player wouldn't have as much value, but I want to bring in more relievers that have good potential. And I want to target Ricky Griggs here. He's a lefty that has really solid K per nine already. Throws a fastball slider, change up curve. Not the fastest uh, velocities, but we're going to continue adding pitching in this episode. And that's our trade. I probably could have added in another player, but it would have probably been like a C or D potential player that would have just caused me to unnecessarily reshuffle things on the team. So that's plenty. One player having a really good year is Domingo Acevedo, and he's 30 years old. Still a lot of team control. He hasn't played at the bigs for a very long time. It looks like the offers are slightly lower at this point. Here's an interesting prospect, though. This is first baseman Brandon Lewis from the Dodgers. 25 years old, a little more power. He is a first baseman who can also play third. I think I'll hold on to Acevedo for now. He's got a ton of team control. I don't have to rush into this one. I think that's the only trade I want to make as far as like trading away a player goes. Here's a prospect I'm interested in. Brennan Davis. B potential, 72 overall. What would it take to get a player like him? Ken Wall the Chuck, who could still, you know, turn things around, hasn't been great. Or the combo of Logan Davidson and Nick Gordon. I'm probably going to stay put with the team for now, but I feel like in the offseason I could look to get some of those skill sets that I've been missing from our uh, first two drafts. I'd like a little more power in the outfield if possible. I had a couple targets that went, unfortunately. But that's going to be our trade deadline. It's not an eventful one this year. Oh, I didn't realize that Griggs was actually a uh, closer down at double A this year. So 13 of 14, we traded for a pretty good double A closer. Not the biggest return to get for a lead miss Diaz, but he wasn't having a great season. And to regain some of that versatility at the big league level, we'll bring back Tyler Wade. I didn't explore this yet, but obviously Cody Bellinger has rebuilt some of his value this year, rising a couple points in overall. What would current trade values look like for Cody if we were looking at just prospects? We're starting to see some higher 60s B. Wow, Taj Bradley, 72A. Home run per nine's a bit of an issue, and he still has a, a ways to go, but that's interesting. You could probably find a few players who are close to being ready for the major leagues right now. But I think I want to see this develop a little bit longer, and we'll revisit this. Finally, let's get to talking about some of these top prospects now. Aaron Don comes in number four in all of baseball. He was, of course, the first round pick back in year one. He mashed down at double A. I'd have to send him back down to pull up his numbers. But so far in 39 at-bats at the AAA level, he's hitting 333. He has four doubles and a home run. So I like how he's slugging a bit better there. The home runs didn't really show up at AA, and maybe that's never a big part of his game. We have a couple players that you can consider making September call-ups when that rolls around, and that would be Aaron Don and Tyler Soderstrom. I really don't know yet if I want to do that now or just wait until next year and try to focus on getting their development as good as I can here at the AAA level. Soderstrom had his struggles in spring training, so he did not make the opening day roster. But I think that he could come up and start contributing. It's just a matter of how well he'd play. When he gets called up to the big league level, I see Aaron Don settling in as the right fielder. I won't play him in center. He doesn't have a very strong arm. And that's the big question with him going into the rest of his career. We know he's a good contact hitter. We know he has good speed. But will he ever become anything more? Will he develop the power? Will his arm get stronger? To truly live up to the draft type, I feel like he needs to become more of a complete player. That or you got to go hit well over 300 and just be dominant in that category. 
That's on the ground, into center field, and Don is aboard. Hey, at least Connor Capel's starting to hit better down at AAA. He was really struggling to begin the year. And I think we're going to be stealing here. This is another thing you get with Aaron Don. I want to hopefully get a lot more stolen bases. We want guys who reach base a lot, can steal a bag or two, get that extra base when the defense is caught slipping. Tyler Soderstrom, we'll be talking about him as well. He's at the plate 0-2. Back up the middle. And nice play by the shortstop to get him. Because Don has a couple weaknesses, notably the power, I'd like to see him finish out the year playing at AAA to maybe have a better chance of showing off power here than the big league level. But absolutely, he'll be on the 40-man roster, invited to spring training, given every opportunity to make his debut on opening day of year three. That's gone. Oh, it's off the scoreboard. It's not gone. Top of the ninth here in a tie game. Runner on first with two away for Aaron Don. That's a drive to left center field. And it doesn't have a ton of carry. Got to get this man in the weight room. Don is in as the ghost runner in the top of the 10th inning. Connor Capel just walked, and that brings up Tyler Soderstrom. And that is knocked down at second base. And Soderstrom is safe. They're loaded up. Trenton Brooks. It was about this time back in year one we began to talk about him and get excited about his power, even though he's a low 60s D potential player. He has power in his game. Base is loaded. No power there. That's going to be a double play. With Don here, you got to take a few steps in, I feel. He doesn't have the power to really uh, throw out a runner in this spot. And, well, this is going to be it. Throwing home. Game on the line. That's not a big league arm yet. Dodgers win. Next, I want to highlight Tyler Soderstrom, and I felt like he might make the opening day roster this year for us. Didn't work out that way, but he spent this season at AAA hitting the ball really well. 270 with an on-base of 333, OPS of 783. 1.9 war, supplying a good deal of offense. Hopefully there's still room for the power to get up there. I would like to see him be a high home run hitter, but... Contact versus lefties has gone up six. Power versus righties has gone up four. My plan with Soderstrom is to bring him up when rosters expand in September and give him a chance to make his big league debut and start to see what he can do because I feel like his ratings are in a good spot, whereas Don has some weaknesses to hone in right now at the AAA level. I like to see Soderstrom finish out at the bigs and stop throwing over to first base. Isn't this, uh, that should be an automatic ball right there. I wish he had sent that one out of the park. That was two good swings and we can't make contact. That's over, second base, a hit for Soderstrom. And the runner goes from first to third. It's just time though for Soderstrom, I think he's ready. The spring training, you know, slump for a couple of weeks is the only reason he hasn't been at the big league level. So that's going to be taken care of soon as a run scores. A chance to talk about another player I'm happy about this year, Darrell Ernais. Another infielder. We have a few that are in that 68 to 70 overall range. And none have, like, overwhelming power. But they're all hitting for a pretty good average down here in the minor leagues. And... You know, they're an injury away, basically, from getting called up. But also, as rosters expand, that I want to take a look at some guys in September. Maybe a guy like Air Nyes gets the call up. Jordan Diaz. Had some fun with him back in year one, but that was short-lived. Denzel Clark. Yes, another outfielder. Hitting 294 this season. He would have been right up there with Baez to get called up in the previous episode. I just thought Baez was a little more intriguing. But Clark will be up there, I think, maybe a spring invite. 
We end up winning this game 3 nothing. Not a ton of action, but Luis Medina shut down the Oklahoma City offense. There's a very good argument for calling up Medina when the rosters expand in September. 67 overall, 24 years old, certainly pitching at a high level at AAA this season. What about our draft pick, Luis Estrella? We drafted him knowing he was basically right at his potential, which made him an odd prospect. Now, he's been regressing this year as the power numbers haven't been great. His power versus lefties has significantly declined. And he doesn't have a homer off of a lefty this year. He's hitting 236. Estrella, I think, is going to be a fun player in time. And I expect next year he begins at AAA. But Estrella has a lot of power and a lot of speed. Now, he doesn't have a lot of anything else. And his potential, like I said, is oddly low. I think his potential is like a 72 and his overall has come down. His defense isn't great, but... You can play him in the field still. It's just he won't be very good at that. Maybe he can still get better. He's an example of why it's not just enough to look at overall in this game because the overall formula in the show, it's looking for well-rounded players and the overall formula hurts players who are more one-dimensional. Well, what if that one dimension happens to be really good power? On top of that, you're really fast. There's always value in that. Now, Estrella just hasn't demonstrated that power this season, only hitting five home runs and playing all year at double-A. I expected better. So that's why he hasn't accelerated through the program. I think that low plate vision could be part of the reason why. It's a 36. With lower plate vision, you do get more inconsistent hitters. The Joey Gallows, Miguel Sanos of the world, home runner bust types. That's ultimately the type of player Estrella is. These guys run hot and cold, and unfortunately, it's been a little cold this year. Is there a chance he gets invited to spring training next year? I don't think it's super likely. I just don't think the big league level is the place to work on your plate vision. I'm hoping that gets better throughout his time in the minor leagues. Now, it does say he was a Texas League All-Star this year. It's not like he's been awful. He's hit 250. I think he's hit for a higher average than you'd expect with less power than you'd expect. So, it's just been an odd year. He has done a good job getting extra base hits, just not the homers as much. He actually has as many triples as home runs with five each and then 12 doubles. He walks here in the sixth inning. That's going to be jammed into right. Hey, we'll take it. It drops in for a hit. And the drive's in a run. Wow, how about this start for Cam Cope? Eight and a third. Gave up six walks, only struck out three, but not a single run surrendered. I've talked about some of the more intriguing position player prospects in the organization already and throughout the uh, episodes lately, but the pitching really has looked really good all year down at like double A, for instance. Elliot Hughes, he was a draft pick of ours last year, but he's injured, so he has not played in a while. When he was playing, he was playing very well. Cam Cope just finished off that excellent outing, which brings his ERA down to 3.95. 76 strikeouts in around 110 innings. So strikeouts are never meant to be his game. And, you know, he just went through a, a game in which he had only a few strikeouts and six walks when the walks are actually supposed to be something he manages quite well. And another pitcher that's played well, especially as of late, is Forrest Whitley. We traded for him from the Houston Astros last season, and Whitley, you know, he hasn't been great at the big leagues so far. We gave him 11 games last year, and they didn't really go well back at the AAA level this season, and he's developed, and I think he's ready for another chance. So perhaps here down the stretch, as we get down here in the season, we could see him back up at the big league level. Luke Weaver has just been awful for us this year. I wish we could just say he's got a sore shoulder and put him on the injured list for the rest of the year. 
This Anthony K signing hasn't worked out. 7.6 ERA. Or this was a, a Rule 5 pickup, but man, he has just been awful against right-handed batters. We'll get Gunnar Hoagland back into the starting rotation. He had a phenomenal start to his Major League career, but it looks like his last couple of starts have not been quite as good, and he dealt with a stint on the injured list, so that kind of ruined some of his momentum. Muller continues to struggle. You almost have to consider sending him down the double A or just making it somebody else's problem and trading him, but I still like a lot of these ratings. I'll stay a bit patient. Medina looks really good, though. Whitley's stock is definitely rising. Pittsburgh has claimed Peter Lambert. I tried to pass him through waivers, so that didn't work. We are not playing our best baseball here in the month of July. We have three wins. The Cubs want to offer a trade. Are you kidding me? They want Seth Brown for Cole Roterer. B potential 70 overall. Okay, this actually isn't like the worst trade offer you could receive. But I'm not accepting it. The Mariners want to offer a trade now. Nick Gordon. I don't want to. Emerson Hancock. That would be interesting. 74 overall. Has actually pitched fairly well for them this year. At both levels. I think I'm going to pass, but that's an extremely good offer. I, I like to still develop Gordon a bit, keep him on the team for a little bit longer, but uh, that is a good deal. I know a lot of you would have taken that one. Just seems our win percentage continues to drop even further every episode. We're 35 and 74, not even in the same area code as fourth place, over 20 games behind the Mariners. But... Now that we're in August, we can view our draft picks and their ratings. Let's take a look. 99 potential on Joe Michael, 85 on Cabrera, 84 on Montez, and then 277s and 84, and then 89 to finish it up. Wow. Those last two picks, I didn't even have full information on them. We begin with Joe Michael. 93 stamina, 97 mile per hour fastball. And he's an 82 overall? Whoa! 82 already? There's no way this guy needs much time in the minor leagues whatsoever. He will already be like the second highest rated player on the entire roster when he first gets to the show. Right behind Teoscar Hernandez. So this is incredible. We have ourselves a generational left-handed pitching prospect who might just be the number one prospect in baseball before he ever pitches a single inning at any level. 86 velo, 73 break. I mean, he is the real deal. He's everything you'd want here in an elite pitching prospect. We followed that up with Miguel Cabrera. He comes in 67 overall. You love where the contact is at already. He's a switch hitter. He has good plate vision. And his defense is a work in progress. I think he'll be playable. I'll probably give him some other outfield for his secondary. It's not just going to be left field only. That's weird. But I'm pretty happy with this skill set. 68 speed isn't phenomenal. And then we go to another starting pitcher prospect in Alfonso Montez. 65 overall on day one. Manages the walks well. Has a five pitch mix. Tops out around 95 on the fastball. Another lefty to develop. Only 62 stamina, though. So you wonder if he ends up being more of a bullpen arm. Unless you can build up that stamina. I'll have to train that. Henry Vasquez. How about a 73 overall with 77 potential? Strikeouts look pretty good for him. We have a righty now. 84 stamina. That's a really high overall for only 18 years old, too. Somebody who could contribute pretty early. Cecil James, a reliever. Only a 55 overall. So he would need a lot of time. He has 77 potential. We'll see if he ever gets there. Everybody we drafted is 18. That was uh, definitely not by design. I wanted a few older prospects, but you know they were gone when I wanted to select them. Luis Crespo is a 61 overall with 84 potential. 
Here's an outfielder who can only play left field for some reason. I'll update that. And he's a pretty good contact hitter. His vision is pretty solid. Like, his skill set has a ton of overlap with Miguel Cabrera. Just not at the same level in terms of contact. And he's a little bit uh, faster. But Crespo gives us another contact hitting outfielder. And we're starting to add up enough to where if we want to go find a different prospect with a different skill set, now we can start doing some prospect swaps. And I think that year three is the time to start exploring that. But we finished it off. Jesse Rivera. Only a 47 overall. Have you ever had success developing these low, super low rated prospects? I haven't done it. But I also don't have a lot of experience in franchise even attempting it. So he's years and years away from a chance. And all his ratings stink. But he has 89 potential. So do with that what you will. I think we had ourselves a pretty good class. I would have liked to maybe get a few different skill sets in there. But as far as getting upside, we got it. As far as early impact, I think we also got it when you think about Michael and maybe being in the bigs next season. Miguel Cabrera probably won't take forever. And then Henry Vazquez is already a 73. Andres Nunez went the pick before Joel Michael. And the Mariners have him at 70 overall with 84 potential. Solid prospect but definitely not on the level of Joe Michael. I missed out on a fan favorite, Diego Dominguez, 67 overall with 76 potential. He's not a terrific prospect, but he can definitely play and probably will for a long time at the big league level. Percy McGregor, 78 potential, but his ratings just aren't great on day one. And maybe he eventually turns into something. He's only 18. The number one pick was Mariano Castillo, a closer going to the Nationals. As they attempt to build up a bullpen, their first three picks were relievers. And they signed Josh Hader. So, they're going with an interesting team building approach. Mauricio Santana. I thought about him with maybe that second pick, but one dimensional player. He does bring power at 60 overall. And that will give him a chance to mash in the minor leagues. We'll see if we ever come across him in the future. Oh, wow. 97 potential here for the Rockies. Nolan Asensio. Not bad. That's the best potential I've seen outside of Joe Michael. James Brantley, 61 overall. He goes to the Padres with 73 potential. David Matsumoto ended up with 89 potential. So I just didn't get to scout him enough. And he brings in a pretty complete offensive skill set. Juan Young Cho, 75 potential. So he also looks like he could be a complete package prospect, but I didn't have him more than like 50% scouted. He's still okay, but probably got overdrafted. And also going in the first round, Tommy Yi. 91 potential, 69 overall with great velocity, high stamina, good strikeout upside. He would have been fine if we couldn't have gone with Joe Michael. He was number two on my board, so he would have been the pick. But we got our guy in Joe Michael, and I'm really excited about the future of this team. Now that we have guys like Aaron Don and Cam Cope, Luis Estrella... And now this class gives us the number one pitching prospect in the last two years, Joe Michael. I think we're going to get to play with him very soon at the big league level. But that's going to wrap us up today. I feel like we only have a couple episodes to go now the rest of the way, just two months of baseball. I will be fitting in a stream perhaps this coming weekend. And then I want to get Tyler Soderstrom up at the big league level finish out the season and see what he can do and get this season wrapped up and see if we finish with any more wins than last year. Right now, I'm not confident in that. Seth Brown still leads the team in home runs with 18, 14 going to Cody Bellinger and Teoscar Hernandez. Nick Gordon has a 274 average. It stayed about the same today. Joshua Baez hitting 256 and 39 at bats. Ken Waldachuk is still doing a really good job. He's at a 72 overall. Been a successful season for him. Mason Miller, 4.96. Boy, 
Perhaps that one episode celebrating uh, a terrific start was not a sign of things to come. Gunnar Hoagland at a 4.84 ERA. He had his moments as well. He and Miller both just trying to make the most out of this season. And Anthony K with his 6.9 ERA. Jeez, minus eight here on the contact versus lefties for Logan Davidson. It's been that bad this season. He had uh, a stint at the major league level that didn't go well, so I'm not sure if that's the biggest reason why he's uh, lost his contact there. 241 is his average versus lefties at AAA. And then Aaron Don's only hitting 176, and unfortunately that contact versus lefties is down to 55. So a little one-dimensional right now, Aaron. One player I haven't talked about at all is Max Schumann. He's hitting 307 at double A, and he's kind of a utility player, and he's developing decently right now. Might be more of the triple A utility man next year, and then only ever an injury away from getting up to the MLB level. And I'll finish it out here. Robert Passan, 285 average. He's doing a really good job at double A. There's just kind of a log jam of players that play, you know, second, short, and third that uh, are ahead of him right now at AAA, but he's getting close. He'll probably be at AAA full-time next year. But that, everybody, is going to bring this episode to an end. What did you think of our second draft in the series? How do you feel about this team going into the future now with Joe Michael entering the organization? Leave your thoughts down below. Drop a like if you enjoyed the video, and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Much more A's franchise on the way. Have a great day, everybody.